Good morning, it's Pastor Ron, and I'm glad to be with you again this morning. Obviously, I wish we could be together up at 156 Stagecoach. It's always such a precious time to be together together, where we can see each other and hug each other and pray together and just sing together, and all the wonderful blessings that come when we assemble in the name of the Lord. And perhaps that day is not too far away. Obviously, we want to take care of every single person who's been entrusted to us, and we're going to have to be creative when we talk about how we're going to come back together, but I've been taking some seminars, our leadership team has been talking, and we hope to be able to give you some more information in the days to come about what that might look like and when that may begin. But what we're talking about, being a good role model, I'm sure you've noticed the same thing that I have. The world at large, and our country right now, is just going through such a heartbreaking time. You look at the news and you just want to buy some Kleenex and you just want to cry and you just want to ache inside because people are going through so many different things. This is a time where we need to, as Christians, model what it looks like to be like Jesus. This is a time when we need to express the very things that Jesus expressed about the value of, of people and the value of, of eternal things and look at the trajectory of life. This is the time when we need to have his heart, speak his words, and have the attitude of Christ. So let me encourage you as you're looking at the world and as you're looking at the paper or the news or whatever else, or even as you're looking in the mirror, let's pray to be the body of Christ. Let's pray for our world. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray for our state. Let's pray for the, the leaders of our, of our nation. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for our church. Let's be who Jesus has called us to be. Let's make our life count. Interestingly, I had finished this sermon before this week. And yet the title of it is, is, it, is one that I want you to really resonate with. Make your life count. Each of us and all of us have a responsibility within the family of faith to be able to point to Christ in the best way. Today, Peter's going to be talking to us very specifically about one of the ways we can do that. But I know what you know. This is not an easy passage. A number of years ago, someone wrote a book called The Hard Teachings of Jesus. And when you read that book, you quickly discovered that there were some very hard teachings of Jesus. There's also some very hard teachings that the apostles shared. Peter, in the next few weeks, we're going to see, gives us some examples of some of the hard teachings. But you know what? The Bible never tells us to do something we can't do through the power of Christ. And so let's pray together. Let's work together. Let's share, let's share together. Let's encourage each other to make our life count, even in times that are difficult, because that's when it's most necessary. May we be like Jesus in word, in attitude, in spirit, in perspective. May we be like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're a great God. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have a plan for each of us and all of us in this world. It begins with us getting to know you, Lord, as a personal Lord and a personal Savior. And then, Lord, you've called us to be salt and light in this world, to stand out, to be different, to be a peculiar people. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to show the love of Christ in every way possible. Father, we pray that we would really ask, what would Jesus say before we speak? What would Jesus do before we take action? What would Jesus think as we're letting things run through our mind and through our heart? Lord, we want to be your representatives by representing you. And we pray we do that well by the help of your Spirit and with our cooperation. We pray now, Lord, that as we open up your word, you'd open up our heart. And we thank you, Lord, for your power. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In September of 19, uh, 1996, astronaut Shannon Lucid was going to be returning to Earth after being up in the space station. You remember space station, you for a record 188 days. Her return was something that she anticipated and certainly her family anticipated it too. But before they were able to make the journey, there were a few delays. There were some hurricanes that were on the scene. There was also some equipment problem that came their way. And so it was delayed. But Shannon, she replied, she remained very upbeat. I love what she said. Listen to her words. She said, I had a great time up here at the base, at the space station. But obviously, I'm anxious to go back to my real home in Houston, Texas and be with my family.
Now, as far as I know, none of us have ever traveled up in space, but we can understand at least a little bit what she was talking about because even when we're having the very best day here on Earth, there's something in us as believers that makes us long to be in our real home, our lasting home, our eternal home with Jesus Christ in heaven. The true story is told of the veteran missionary couple who were retiring after years and years of hard and very sacrificial service. They were returning back to the United States by ship, and they just happened to be on the same ocean liner as President Theodore Roosevelt, who had been on a hunting expedition. When they got off the ship, they saw that a big group of people had come to cheer for the president, and they were so excited to be able to see the crowd and the band and everything that was there, but then they recognized that no one had showed up to pick them up at all. And the older missionary, with tears in his eyes, said to his wife, We've given our lives to serve the Lord in a very difficult place and in a very difficult ministry, and not even one person came to welcome us home. And if you've ever heard this story, you remember what she said to him. She turned and said, But dear, you aren't home yet. Oh, how important it is for us to remember that until we are in heaven, we are not home. We aren't home yet until we are in heaven. Last week in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, in verses 11 and 12, the apostle Peter built on that truth, telling his readers, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that's the non-believers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Talk about straight talk. Talk about hitting the nail squarely on the head. As followers of Christ, we're to remember, while we're in this world, we are aliens. We are strangers. We are sojourners. We are pilgrims. That's what our classification is here in this world. This world is not our home. We are just the passing through. We have another homeland we are traveling to, and it's our real home. It's our lasting home. Our, it's eternal home. It's the one that was purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As temporary dwellers, we are to live up to our true identity of being children of God. We are to stay away from sinful desires that war against our soul. We are to live in such a way that when non-believers examine us, and they are watching us, as we talked about last week, that they see that there's a difference in us. There's a difference in us that's so great. It's the one who's in us that is so great that they see, even when they're giving us a difficult time, even when they mistreat us, even when they say things against us that are not so, we show them the good deeds in our lives, and in, do, in so doing, they go on with us to glorify God on the day he visits us. How are we to await heaven? We are to live good lives, not in isolation, but among non-believers, we are to live in such a way that we encourage other people to take a closer look at our lives, and in so doing, they see our good works, and they end up lining up with us to praise God on the day He comes to visit us. Now, what's true for individual Christians is equally true for the collective body, the church. We are to be called, we are called to have a good reputation. So instead of fleeing places of dire need, we're to see them as potential outposts for Christian influence. Instead of simply bemoaning the wickedness and the secularism that's in this world, we are called to let our light shine. Instead of behind, staying behind the walls of the church, we are to go out into the world and share the message of the gospel. We are to deepen not only our inreach, but deepen our outreach. We are to teach the word, and we are to live the word out. We can't be salt if we remain in the shaker. We can't be light if we keep it hidden under a basket. We are called to be roaring lambs, if you will. We are called to engage the culture in the name of Jesus through his love and through his power. That's what it means to be an alien or a sojourner in this world for the Lord's sake. But our job description doesn't stop there. Look with me at what Peter has to say as he's led of the Spirit in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 13 and verse 14. He says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Now those are very strong words, aren't they? If you look up in the Bible dictionary, the word submit, 
the word submit, you'll see that it means to subordinate yourself under another, or to rank yourself under another's authority. If you were to do a word study and you would see that this, this word submit that we read in the Bible is actually a military term, it means to get in line. Now, it's not a calling to be a timid person. It's not a calling to be a, a fearful person. It's to be a conscious action, a conscious choice of action, if you will, where we as Christians willingly submit ourselves to subordinate ourselves, if you will, to every legitimate governmental authority. Now, Peter's words are very specific. He tells us to respect the ordinance of man, all the ordinance of man, and every institution, whether it be from the king or those who are sent in his name. Now, those words, they're hard to read, and they're even harder to live out. Who wouldn't admit that expressing, demonstrating, if you will, godly submission is not an easy thing? It never has been, and it never will be. No one had to tell the Apostle Peter that he was living in the midst of the diaspora, a time of intense persecution against believers. Yes, Peter knew that the world doesn't encourage godly submission. That's the reason why he tells us to be different from the world and to be willing to submit ourselves. Do you see that? We are to be willing to submit ourselves. Now to drive this home and the importance of it, he shares with us why this is so important. He says it is for the Lord's sake. Why are we to willingly submit ourselves? It is for the Lord's sake. And to whom are we to submit? He says to every authority instituted among men. Peter mentions kings and he mentions governors, but if you read the book of Romans, you'll see that this calling also is more broadly applied than, than those, just those two instances institutions or two positions. Can we talk? Can we talk on a really personal level? May I speak to you very openly and very honestly? I pray that I can and I believe that I can. This calling of submitting ourselves goes against our human nature, doesn't it? Truth be told, we don't like it. We don't like it at all. We don't even like to think about somebody telling us what to do. And if they do tell us what to do, there's just something about us that wants to do just the opposite of what they said. Just like if you see a, a sign that says wet paint, there's something about it you just, just want to touch it. And there's, there's no doubt about it. There are things that the government tells us that we don't agree with. We don't like some of the rules. We don't like some of the regulations. We don't like some of the restrictive laws. And that should not surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us at all. Listen to how the prophet Isaiah described human nature back in chapter 53, verse 6. He said, we all, there's no exceptions to this, we all are like sheep, and we've gone astray. Each one of us have turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. Who among us wouldn't admit that there's an individualistic spirit within each of us and all of us? We all want to go our own way. And when we want to go our own way, what happens? We tend to bring turmoil, not just on other people, not just on the world at large, but even in our own personal world. And that brings about so much iniquity that we can't even handle it ourselves. And what do we need? We need a Savior. And that's why Jesus came. He came for us. But I feel led to go a little bit deeper than just telling us these things. We are to obey even if we do not like what we've been told. Did you hear the story about the little boy who disobeyed his mother? She disciplined by him by making him go into the corner and, and just sit in the chair. And after he sat there for quite a while, she said to him, Have you learned your lesson yet? Have you learned your yes lesson yet? And he answered her by saying, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. Who can't relate to that story? I know that I can, and maybe you can as well. It's hard enough to submit to the authorities who we see are wise and honest and fair and compassionate. But it's harder, it's harder yet to submit to those who appear to be lacking wisdom and discretion, prudence and foresight. It's harder yet to, to submit when we see people who are cruel and dishonest, frustrating and narcissistic. And it's even harder to submit to someone who's a poor example, making rules that don't just appear wrong, they're wronger than wrong. And sometimes they make rules for other people, but the last one that they follow is themselves. They don't even follow the rules that they, they put on other people. This is a hard calling. It's a very hard calling to hear in any day and time. It's a hard calling to hear in all our day and time, but think about how much more difficult it would be to have heard it in the midst of a time of persecution.
Think about how difficult it would have been to have heard this idea of submitting to one who was called Nero. History tells us that he had his own mother put to death. History tells us that he had his own wife put to death. History tells us that he had political advisors, many of his political advisors, put to death. And I'll tell you why, because he trusted absolutely no one. On top of that, Nero targeted Christians for persecution. He forced them to leave their homes and leave behind treasured possessions. He turned many of them into slaves. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you see that it was not uncommon in those days for the bodies of Christians who had been executed by Nero to be stacked up real high up in piles. And in the days to come, Peter, the very one who wrote this letter, would be crucified by orders of Nero. Now, please don't misunderstand. When Peter tells us to submit to governmental authorities, he is not calling us to absolute obedience to the governmental powers in all cases, without exception whatsoever. We hear that again. He is not calling us to agree and to submit with all government authorities without exception. It's a calling to submit to every institution as government so long as it does not require us to disobey the clear commands of God that are revealed in his word. What are you saying, Pastor Ron? Here's what I'm saying. There are limits to how much a Christian should submit. But we need to be sure when we go against those limits that what we're doing is responding according to God's commands, not something that we don't like, not something that's not our personal preference. Let me give you some examples. Do you remember in the book of Exodus, we read about the Pharaoh when, when he told the Egyptian midwives, when a little boy is born to the Jewish people, then you need to take that little boy's life. What did they do? They said, we're not going to do that. We recognize the value of life, and we will not do that, and thank the Lord. They did what was right, and they didn't submit against the rules of God. Remember a young man by the name of Daniel, and he had three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were told that they needed to obey the king's orders, and they were told that they needed to worship idols, and they were to stop praying to God. But they weren't willing to do that. They did what was right. They did what was godly. They obeyed what God had to say. And what about the times the apostles were told to stop preaching and teaching in Jesus' name? Peter, the very one who wrote this book, the one who penned the words, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, together with the apostle John, said these words in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight for you to obey God or you, for we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. If you have to make a choice between God and authorities, you are to go with God each and every time. And later in book of Acts chapter 5, Peter and the other apostles appeared before the Sanhedrin, the, the Supreme Court of the day, and, and they spoke with them. And the Sanhedrin said to them these words, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, yet you filled up Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And how did they respond? Listen to their words in verse 29. We must obey God rather than men. We hear that again. We must obey God rather than men. In other words, when we have to choose between obeying God and man-made laws, we are to choose God each and every time. But unless that happens, we hear that again, unless that happens, we as Christians are called to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man. Now think about it this way. The scripture isn't telling us that we have an absolute authority in the governing over us. It's telling us that we owe the submission to those who are over us because we submit to God. Do you see the difference? We are so not submitting ourselves because we look up to them or think that it's right. We're making this choice because we are submitting to God. Now, why is this so important? Why is it so important to have this attitude and, and willing to make this particular choice? Why is it that the Spirit of God so presses Peter to drive this home so strongly? Well, look with me at verses 15 and 16 because they'll answer those questions. For it is God's will. Stop there just for a minute. Whose will is it for us to have godly submission? It is God's will. Look how the verse continues. That by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live your lives. Now stop there again. 
You can't live the life of anyone else, and no one else can live your life, but you can live your own, and you can do what God tells you to do because he's not going to ask you to do something that doesn't give you the power to be able to do it. He said, I want you to live your life how? Look how the verse continues, as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Now, those last five words say it all. If you write in your Bible, let me encourage you to underline those words, live as servants of God. Now, why is this so important? Well, Peter's going to cite a few reasons for us. So I read this text, and as I prayed over this text, I see three different things. And the first is this. Why is this so important? Because when we do good, it silences our critics. You hear that again? When we choose to do good, and it is a choice, it silences our our critics. When this letter was written, a lot of cruel and very untrue rumors were being spread around about Christians. Accusations were just going left and right. But when those accusations came against people who are known to have good reputations, all of a sudden, they started to just fall on shallow ground. When we're model citizens and we pray for our leaders and we seek to vote as we're supposed to and we seek to obey the law and we're known for doing good, when people start to speak against us, many times they are silenced. Why is this so important? I'll tell you why. It's important because when you choose to do the right thing, when you choose to do like Jesus, many times it silences your critics. But there's a second thing I see in this particular passage, and the second is this. We are called to live our lives as free men, but not to use our freedom to cover up for evil. In other words, we are to live as servants of God. We're not to look for loopholes. We're not to try to take advantage of other people under the guise of freedom. But there's even more to it than that in these verses. Right after saying that we are to submit ourselves for the Lord's sake, to every authority instituted among men, Peter went on to say, live as free men. Now, some people read those words in the Bible and they say, wow, those words are contradictory. How can you live in submission and at the same time live in free men? doesn't make sense. Those words don't go together. Why would Peter ever put that in the Bible? Well, now, please hear me very closely and very, very carefully and far more importantly, hear biblical truth. Submission is not the opposite of freedom. Hold on, Pastor Ron, what are you saying? I'm saying just what I said. Submission, godly submission, is not the opposite of freedom. In fact, rightly understood, submission is actually a, paves the way to greater freedom. That's right. Submission, godly submission, paves the way to greater freedom. Well, if you're going to say something like that, you're going to have to be willing to back it up. Okay, I will. Now think with me. What does a really good, what does a great coach do? He or she, as the members of their team, submit to them. What do they have them do? They have them take a playbook and learn that playbook. Have you ever seen one of those? Those things are huge. They take time. They take effort. They take practice over and over and over again. Read the playbook, but that's not all that, not all that they do. They want you to go out and work out in the, in the workroom. They want you to go work out, work out, lifting weights and running and doing all kinds of other things. And then what do they want you to do? They want you to spend hours and hours and hours in practice. Those things are, aren't easy to do. But they're not bad things, they're good things, because what do they yield for us? They yield for us discipline and character, and the benefits that those things bring about not only make the game a more enjoyable, a more successful venture, but they make the people whose lives who live under that submission better, because they learn value of discipline and character. And what's true for a sports team is equally true from musical instruction. Have you ever been around a musical instructor? He or she has their students practice hour after hour after hour. If any of your children or grandchildren are ever learning to play an instrument, you know you hear hour after hour after hour practice. And that's, that's not a bad thing either. That's a good thing. Being dedicated to practice prepares them not just for future auditions and opportunities, but it enjoys them. It prepares them to be able to enjoy playing an instrument for the rest of their life. And I want you to know what's true for a sports coach and also for a musical instructor is, is equally true for a teacher. A great teacher is aware of the fact that they don't just simply teach a subject or material. A great student teaches, a great teacher teaches students and they have their students submit to them. Think with me about what a great teacher asked 
their students to do. They want them to attend class even when they don't want to. They want them to study, even when that's the last thing that they want them to do. They want them to do the homework when they'd rather be doing almost anything else. And then they want them to study for and then take tests. This is not done just to get a better grade or even to learn material, but to prepare them to be able to apply those things they've learned in class and again, exercise self-discipline. And what do they achieve in the process? A lot more success, a lot more success in everything that they do. Because I was thinking about that particular example, I remember back years and years and years ago, there was a young man who was in my life, a very special young man, and he had a great personality, he had a real engaging sense of humor, and to say the least, he had a lot of friends. But there was times that he dedicated so much time to his schooling, and his, his friends didn't like it. And I remember one of his friends came up to me one day and said, Pastor Ron, I just think that so-and-so spends far too much time working on school stuff. And I just think maybe you need to talk to him a little bit about that. And I said, really? I said, well, can we talk about what you're asking me to do before you want me to go talk to him? And they said, sure. Why don't you ask us a few questions if you want to? And I said, well, let me ask you this. If your friend works real hard in school, do you think he'd have a better chance of being accepted in college? Well, yes, I think he would. Do you think you'd have a better chance of being accepted than the college he would want to go to rather than just any college? Well, yes, I think he did. He would. Do you think if he was able to get into the college he wanted to get into, do you think he'd be able to excel if he was a little bit more prepared when he got there? Well, yeah, I think that would happen. Do you think he'd be more likely to graduate? Well, yes, I think he'd be more apt, likely to graduate. If he was able to graduate with better grades and he would excel in school, do you think he'd have a chance of getting a, a better job? Well, yeah, I think he'd, he'd like to do that. Do you think he'd be happier on the job that he'd have? Well, yes, I think he'd do that too. If he was happier on his job and he was successful in his job, do you think he'd have a better home life than he might have otherwise? Well, yes, I think he would. Do you think he'd be able to take care of his future family a little bit better? Yeah, I think he'd be able to do that too. Do you think if, if he were able to do that, that other blessings would come his ways that maybe aren't as far out? Maybe think about this. Do you think he'd have a better car? Do you think he'd live in a nicer home? Do you think he'd be able to take better vacations? Do you think he'd be able to retire a little bit earlier? Do you think that he'd be in a little bit better shape in his spirit and in his, in his soul and in his heart and in his mind and in his body? Yes, he's studying a lot, and there's no doubt about that. But the studying that he's putting forth is going to give him a life of freedom. Freedom. So much more freedom then you can even begin to measure now. Yes, for a few years it was hard, but it was worth it because it would pay off in the long run so much more. And what's true for a student and a coach, true for a teacher, is true in life. If we're going to make our life count, we need to be willing to do what's hard now to have a payoff, not just in the days to come but throughout eternity. And if those examples aren't compelling enough, think about it this way. A roller coaster is fun to ride on, but the fun stops if all of a sudden the roller coaster goes off the rails. And what's true for a roller coaster is true for the government. Without government, society goes right off the rails. It would just become lawless and a very dangerous place. Right now, many of us don't like the fact that our roads are in such bad shape. But can you imagine what it would be like if we had no government at all? The roads would be even be in greater disrepair. Can you imagine what it would be like if they didn't test our food and it wouldn't be safe? And I know there are places that the water is not safe in the world in which we live. But if there was no government at all, the water wouldn't be safe either. Without government, there would be chaos and it would be total anarchy. And that leads us to a third reason, that we are to godly submit. Peter shared this truth. Listen to verse 17. He said, show proper respect to how many people? To everyone. Everyone. How many people are we to properly respect? We are properly respect everyone. Then he goes on and says, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, honor the king. Now, what's the third reason that Peter has led of the Spirit to stress the fact that we are to 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 willingly participate in healthy submission. Here's the third reason. It promotes, it promotes healthier relationships with other people. Wow. Who wouldn't want to have healthier relationships with other people? Now notice the tense of the verbs in these sentences. We are to not just have respect, but keep on having respect for how many people? For everyone. We are to keep on on loving the believers, we are to keep on fearing God, and we are to keep on honoring the king. 
taking those small steps of obedience by respecting everyone, by having love in our hearts, by showing reverence and honor leads to bigger steps and the promotion of healthier relationships. Now think with me on a very personal level about how much more our lives would improve and how much more evident the power of God would be shown in us if we treated all people with respect, proper respect. Think with me about how much our lives would improve and how much more evident the power of God would be in our life if we truly did love all the members of the Christian family. Think with me about how much our personal lives would improve, but how much more evident the power of God would be within us if we truly respected the Lord, placing Him above all others and looking to Him as the final authority. Think with me about how much not only our lives would improve, but how much more evident the power of God would be in us if we made the choice to honor the King by being a model citizen. Now, some people may say, it's my goal to show proper respect to all people. It's my goal to love believers. It's my goal to fear the fear of God. But truth be told, I have a hard time honoring the king. I have a hard time honoring a governmental leader, especially a governmental leader of whatever variety and whatever position where I have no respect. Now, interestingly... The word translated king in verse 13 is not the same word that's being translated in verse 17, and that's significant. In the verse 13, the word king speaks of an individual monarch. We hear that again. In verse 13, it speaks of an individual monarch. In verse 17, the word that's used for king speaks not of an individual monarch, but of a monarchy. Therefore, we are to honor the office, even if we disagree with the person who holds it. Did you notice that we aren't told to love the king? We, aren't, we are told to love the children of God. We aren't told to fear the king, but to fear or have awe for God. We aren't commanded even to esteem the king, but as an individual, we are to respect him or her and give them proper respect for the office in which they serve. Wouldn't the world at large and our personal worlds be so much better if we took this calling to heart? Wouldn't the power of God be so much more evident in our lives if we lived out these directives? Some time ago, I read about a man who was driving over a very narrow one-lane bridge. In front of the bridge, before he got on, he saw a sign, and the sign said, Yield, in very big letters. On his way back, he came back to that narrow one-lane bridge and when he started on the other direction he saw another yield sign and that really caught his attention he said to himself there was a yield sign posted on one side and then there was a yield sign posted on the other side too there's yield signs posted on both sides of the bridge why are these signs these yield signs put on both sides of the bridge well, the answer is very obvious they were posted for the very same reason that peter wrote second peter chapter 13 through 17 they were meant for protection. They were meant for protection. Now you may be thinking, sounds good, Pastor, but who could possibly do all the things that Peter spoke about? No one could. It's not even possible. Hear my heart. It wasn't only possible. Someone did it. Someone did all these things. Who? Jesus did. He showed proper respect for all people. One of the things I love is when he, Jesus is traveling with his disciples, and he said, I have a need to go to Samaria. And they couldn't understand that at all. They wanted to go around Samaria. They didn't want to even look at Samaria, much less put a foot in Samaria. But Jesus said, I have a need to go to Samaria. Why? To go see a woman, a woman who would only come out in the middle of the day so that others wouldn't be by her. I have a need to see this woman because he saw love and value in her and led her to himself. What a wonderful example Jesus was to the woman of Samaria. But he wasn't the only, she wasn't the only one he showed wonder and love, wonderful love through. How about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, remember when we were children, was a wee little man who went and climbed up on a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. But when Jesus saw him, he didn't just look at him, he talked to him. And he said, I want to go to your house. Here was Zacchaeus, a tax collector, one who had defrauded many people. And he spent some time with Jesus. And after spending time with Jesus, he comes down. And we know that he met the Lord because anybody who I've cheated, I'm going to pay him back extra. And I'm going to be a different man from here on. 
And Zacchaeus and the woman at the well weren't the only ones that Jesus showed proper respect to. He also went to Matthew's house. Remember when he went to Matthew's house? A lot of people were complaining. Why would he go to Matthew's house? Does he not know that Matthew was a tax collector? He's not one who we favor, and yet he went to Matthew's house, and when he went there, people made all kinds of rumors about why the Lord went there, but he went there, and then when he went there, what happened? Matthew became a believer and followed the Lord. In fact, he wrote the book of Matthew. But that's not the only thing we see. Not only did Jesus show respect to all people, he allowed himself to be wounded in order for us to be healed. By his stripes we have been healed. And he allowed himself to die so that we might live. Jesus honored the Father in the way he lived his life on earth and even in his prayers. No greater prayer has ever been prayed than the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Not my will but thine be done. And Jesus even honored the ruling authority Pilate when he was being misused and abused and falsely accused and even mocked before him. Jesus knew. He knew he was a temporary dweller on this earth, and so are we. We hear that again? Jesus knew he was a temporary dweller on this earth, and so are we. He knew his real home, just like our real home as Christians, is not on earth, but is in heaven. Just see what I do? I pray that you do. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, we have a very poignant reminder. It is important for us to remember how we choose to live our lives. How we choose to live our lives matters. It matters a lot. Now think with me. Think with me about how much not only our individual lives would improve, but how much more evident the power of God would be in us if we made the choice to make our lives count. Make your life count. Make your life count for your family. Make your life count for your friends. Make your life count for other people. Make your life count, most of all, for Jesus Christ. Make your life count. No. You can't live for other people. And they can't live for you. But you can make your life count by being like Jesus. By speaking the words that he spoke. By thinking the thoughts that he thought. By demonstrating the attitude that he had. And by choosing to be a witness not only of his power, but a witness of his love. Think with me how much better the world would be our personal worlds would be, and the power of Christ would be shown, it made manifest, if we made our lives count by willingly being like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can read hard words in the Bible, and Lord, even though there's a spirit within us that pulls against these things, when we really pray about them, and when we really think about them, they do make sense. Father, we want to have you above everything and everyone. And Father, we want to always follow what you have. And Lord, there's times we need to take a stand in one way or the other. But even in those times when we take a stand, may we take a stand with the heart of Christ. May we see through your eyes and may we want to. May we reach forth with your heart and may we want to. May we speak words of life and light and caring. May we remember that our time here on this earth is short. May we remember we've been given a special entrustment to show Jesus Christ in this world. May that be our desire. May that be our prime objective. As the old song says, may others see Jesus in me. Father, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to ruminate with these truths and to understand how much different the world can be and our worlds can be when we take even the difficult truths to heart and make the choice to live them out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.